Hey guys, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry and this second video in the five-part build series for making groats, the greatest rollers of all time. In the first episode, I went in depth showing these tangent ramp outfeed roller stands in use so you can see why I would devote five episodes in a series to show you how to build them and to give you kind of an overview of the build process. I started the actual build using this amazing Evolution metal cutting chop saw to cut a round and square stock that gets used for the various parts on these roller stands. And in this video, I'm going to go beyond the standard cuts for cutting these things to length to further fabricate the various pieces that will get welded up in future episodes in the series. I'll start by switching from cuts I made for cutting round and square tube stock in episode one to cutting flat stock for the roller support tabs and the flat stock that makes up this pivot housing on the roller stands. And I'll include all the information you need for making the roller stands in this video. But I also want to tell you that I now have a set of PDF plans that are available for the roller stand. And inside the plan set is a cut list and a hardware list for all this stuff. So I'm using the cut list in the PDF plans for lengths and quantities for cutting these pieces. The plans are for building one roller stand. I'm building a pair of them, so I just double the quantities in the cut list. And I'll start out that process by using this inch and a half by quarter inch thick flat stock to cut four pieces three and a half inches long for these tabs and four more pieces inch and three eighths long for the caps on this pivot housing. So now it's time to fire up the Evolution chop saw. Simple cuts like this on flat stock are definitely not rocket surgery. All I do is mark the three and a half inch length from a square end on a piece and draw a square line for lining up with the saw blade. I use a tail on one side of the mark to indicate where the saw curve goes and write pattern on the piece for clarity. If you've not used a metal cutting chop saw much, I'll explain here that it's always better to cut the thinnest profile on the piece. So rather than laying the piece down like this, like I might do with a wood cutting chop saw, I'll stand it up on edge and align the saw blade to the side of the mark where the blade's curve goes before sliding the quick action clamp into place and locking it firmly with a twist of the handle before cutting. Another important thing for cutting flat stock on edge like this is to make sure that the blade comes to full RPM before slowly engaging it into the work. If the blade isn't up to full RPM or if the initial feed rate is too fast, you could chip or break teeth as the blade encounters the workpiece. But if you follow these simple steps, the cuts are quick, clean, fast, and accurate. The saw is noisy and clean cuts on the pieces are sharp, so wear whatever PPE you deem necessary to protect your body and senses while you're doing this kind of work. And I use the exact same sequence and process for cutting the four tabs at one and three eighths inches long. And after just a few minutes, I've got all eight pieces of this quarter inch by inch and a half flat stock cut to size. Next, per the cut list on the plans, I'm gonna switch to the eighth inch by four inch stock and cut four plates for this pivot housing in much the same manner as the pieces I just cut. I start by double checking that the end of this four inch wide piece is square and then use the rule and square to mark off the four inch length for the pivot housing plates. And then it's back to the saw for the cutting procedure, which is pretty much like what you've already seen, but I wanted to show you this because it's kind of unusual to be cutting this wide thin stock with a metal cutting chop saw if you've never done it before. Again, I make sure the blade is up to full RPM before cautiously but steadily lowering the spinning blade into and through the workpiece. With those pieces of flat stock cut, I'll move to the next step, which is a simple notch, although it's probably harder to explain than it is to see. So I'll just pop the head off the groat here and focus the camera in on this connection right here. This is a detail that's actually easier to see on the plans, but the way this works is I want the roller ramp tube to pass through this cross tube here. So the notch is three quarters by three quarters so that this piece of square tube passes through that piece of square tube. And because it's not a through cut, I approach it a little bit differently, although this isn't brain science either. There's any number of ways of marking these cross tubes that got cut in episode one for the notches for the roller ramp tubes but rather than using rules and squares, I'm just using a clean cut 
on a piece of three quarter by three quarter square tubing and a fine sharpie marker to mark the notches on both ends of both tubes quickly and accurately. Once all the pieces are marked, it's back to the evolution chop saw to start the notches with a vertical cut through one face of the tube. To speed up the process of making these cuts, add a piece of masking tape to the saw table and mark it so that the cuts are the same three quarters of an inch in from each end of each of these cross tubes for consistent notches. And for the depth of cut here, I'm just kind of eyeballing down to my other Sharpie mark, which as you'll see, is a good start and plenty close enough for consistent notching. Starting those notches on the Evolution saw is what makes them accurate and consistent, but for safety and efficiency, I'll finish the notches using a Metabo handheld angle grinder with a 40 thousandths cutoff wheel in it. But to make that safe, I want to introduce you to another amazing tool here from my friends at Acme Tools, and it's this five and a half inch multi-purpose bench vise by Wilton. This thing is a real beast that I got as an upgrade to the older, smaller model that I've had on the bench for a couple of decades. And I'm breaking it out here for the Grote build video series to show how useful, versatile, and functional it is for metalworking projects like this. The features that I like about this model of vise are not only that the vise itself pivots 360 degrees, but the head rotates so that I can use either the straight jaw or the pipe jaw for clamping and working on irregular size and shape pieces, which is especially helpful on the wide range of shapes and types of pieces used for building these grill roller stands. I'll go more in depth with other features that this vise has to offer as the build series continues, but for now, for clarity, I'm just going to clamp the vise to the corner of my work surface here to hold these pieces of inch and a quarter square tube while I complete the four notches for the roller ramp tubes. And finishing up these notches is a perfect example of how the rotating head of the vise makes it easy to position the workpiece to keep an eye on the cut line and position the grinder for making a clean, accurate cut. And with the help of that Wilton vise, it literally takes only seconds to complete the notches on the ends of these cross tubes for a perfect fit of the three quarter by three quarter inch square roller ramp tube. And sometime before the end of this video series, I'm going to get that vise swapped out with the old one on the bench over there to be responsible because as it is, the vise is capable of a lot more work than it can do while held to this work surface with those little clamps. This is the part in the build where we go from somewhat unusual cutting techniques to the advanced cutting techniques written out on the whiteboard there because it's time to make cuts for the legs on the groats. And there's uh, two cuts here. You can't see it because of this housing, but the legs slope at 60 degrees to the table. So there's a, a 30 degree included angle cut on the top end of each of the four legs for two roller stands. And then on the bottom, there's a notch, a curved notch, so that the leg straddles uh, the foot bar there with a nice curved fit for simple clean welds. And I see these cuts as moving into advanced territory because, uh, as you know from a previous episode about uh, Evolution Chop Saw, that its cutting capacity is 45 degrees. And from that viewpoint, this cut needs to be 60 degrees. So to make up the difference between 45 and 60 degree cuts, I've got this special block that's made with a 15 degree included angle to help assist in making these four 60 degree angle cuts. Back to the chop saw. I put a Sharpie line here on the end of the tube to show that 30 degree included angle, which registers as 60 degrees on the chop saw to use it for setup and reference. And you can see when I rotate the fence on the saw to its maximum 45 degree capacity, that the angle of the cut needed and the angle of the cut the saw can make is off by 15 degrees. So I need to swing this piece around like this so that the blade and the cut line up. And here's that 15 degree space in between the fence at the maximum setting and the workpiece positioned where it needs to be for this cut. And that's where this 15 degree angle block comes in. I can just slip this into place here and then slide the workpiece forward until the blade lines up with that cut mark. 
So that's the setup required to position the piece properly. But I can't cut it at this point because the cutting action of the blade here will pull that workpiece forward. It'll bind on the blade, catch the workpiece, damage the blade, make an inaccurate cut, etc. So what I need to do is to make this whole setup strong and permanent so it can resist the cutting force of the teeth on the workpiece and get a clean, accurate, safe cut. And to accomplish that, I added this piece of steel plate to the angle block with five screws so that that plate is firmly attached to the block of wood. Then I can slide it into place and get everything positioned for this cut. And then I use a positive clamp on the miter fence to make sure that wooden angle spacer block isn't going anywhere. And double check the position of the cut. Once again, that looks good so that I can take the next step, which is to take a scrap block of wood, butt it against the square end of this angle piece, and clamp it firmly in place. So you can see that this angle block holds the workpiece at the correct angle for making the cut, and this stop block prevents the workpiece from advancing while the cut's being made. So now I can flip the quick release into place and tighten the clamp with a few twists of the blue knob to hold everything permanently and safely in place while making the cut. And this is what this advanced cutting technique looks like in action. I make sure that the blade is spinning at full RPM and then bring it down slowly and confidently in and through the workpiece while making this cut that clearly exceeds the normal cutting capacity of this saw. And you can see the results I get using these advanced techniques because I get a very clean, very accurate angle cut that's square to two faces and 30 degrees from the edge, which is exactly what I need for an accurate fit of the legs on the groat roller stands. And I want to add a few extra comments here regarding this technique. And the first one is that I choose to put this angle cut on first because there's a little more variability in just where that cut comes out. And I find it easier to make that angle cut first and then measure to lay out the round notch at the bottom of the leg later uh, using a hole saw. That'll be next. But it's debatable if that's the best sequence or not. And that's up to the individual fabricator. And another important point to mention is that making a, this cut on that saw is about maxing it out. If I had to go 70 degrees, I probably couldn't use the spacer um, angle block technique because the way the miter clamp is positioned on the saw restricts it to about that. So if I had to make a cut that was at a sharper angle, I would probably have to do it handheld with a cutoff wheel and then dress it up to true it up. But luckily I can cut this angle on that saw with this method. And it probably goes without saying, cuts made at any angle between 45 and 60 degrees can be done easily just by adjusting the angle of this block. And for example, if you needed to cut a 55 degree angle, the angle of this block would be 10 degrees, but the rest of the setup and procedure is the same. And because making this cut is beyond the manufacturer's angle cutting capacity for the saw, you're kind of taking the matter into your own hands. If it's something you're uncomfortable with because of the, the look or the risk of the setup, just don't do it this way. Mark the angle out accurately with a square and a marker and cut it with the bandsaw, a sawzall, or a cutoff disc and then true the cuts up so that they're accurate enough for a finished piece on the roller stand. And because you might end up using other methods to get to this point, it's another reason for cutting the angle first and doing the round notch later. So I'm going to get those other angle cuts made and then move on to the round notch, which is another advanced cutting technique. And you just gotta love how quickly and cleanly the Evolution S380 CPS 15 inch metal cutting chop saw slices a 60 degree angle on the end of this heavy gauge inch and a quarter square steel tubing. Bada bing, bada boom. The length of these square leg tubes from the sharp point of the angles we just cut to the point where the face of the leg meets the inch and a half diameter cross tube at the bottom is 23 inches. And you can see that clearly laid out in the plans. So I'll take that measurement and lay out this curved notch at the bottom of one of these legs so you can see the challenges involved in cutting this round notch. 
To make sure the layout for these round notches is accurate, I start by using a small smooth file to remove any burrs from the sharp angle cut on the upper end of these leg tubes. And then I use a tape measure and sharp sharpie to mark the 23 and a half inch length for the round notch on this leg. Next, I take one of the horizontal leg tubes and line it up with that square layout mark and draw the arc that needs to be cut for the notch on this leg. And it's just as simple as that. The fact that the cross tube is an inch and a half in diameter and the leg is only an inch and a quarter wide means that making this notch with a hole saw is a little bit tricky because the location of the pilot hole is going to determine where that round notch gets made. And that can be a little bit tricky to do consistently so I'm going to make a little drilling fixture to make using this inch and a half hole saw for making these round notches quicker, easier, more consistent, and more accurate. I start by using a hole saw to drill an inch and a half diameter hole through the center of a hardwood block that's about three and a quarter inches wide. Next, I use a sharpie and square to carefully lay out an inch and a quarter wide by half inch deep dado on the underside of the block. And then make multiple passes on the table saw to plow that dado until I've got a clean, snug fit of this guide block on the leg tubes. Once the drilling guide block is made, using it is merely a matter of dropping it onto one of the leg tubes, aligning the hole in the guide block with the layout mark for the round notch, and clamping it into place. With this block as a guide, I can use the hole saw running at low RPM without its pilot bit to cut the round notch exactly where it needs to be. Even though it's messy, I use a generous stream of cutting oil while drilling this round notch to make the notching process quicker and extend the life of this hole saw. Because this isn't a machine shop and I'm using a block of wood as a drill guide for a hole saw through a piece of steel, there's some variation in the way these curved notches come out. But by and large, it's a quick, safe, and reasonably accurate way of getting consistent results for the round notches on the ends of the four leg tubes. And these results are more than acceptable compared to other methods for making this sort of a notch with other tools or different techniques. Once I've finished making round notches on the bottom of each of the four legs, I spent a few minutes with an 80 grit flap disc in an angle grinder to clean up sharp burrs on the round notches as well as end cuts on the rest of the pieces that I've made so far. This quick and simple step makes the pieces safer to handle and allows me to get a better fit and finish in the following steps as the build continues. As you can see, it doesn't take much of a touch to clean up the ends of these pipes because the cuts themselves are so crisp and clean from using the Evolution Chop Saw and the sharp carbide blade. And after a few minutes, all the parts are cleaned up and ready to move on to the next step, which, if I do say, is one of the more interesting steps of the build. If this is the first time you've tackled a project like this, it can seem a bit intimidating, kind of like eating an elephant, but I was told a long time ago that the secret to eating an elephant is taking one bite at a time, and we've taken quite a few nibbles on this guy to get to this point with straight and angle cuts, curved and square notches. And that takes us to the point we are now, where the next bite is kind of a big one because it involves making these curved pieces here that form the curve of the ramp, which is the heart and soul of the Groat outfeed roller ramp design. And there's a few ways of going about that. And the easiest one is to simply run down to the store and buy a piece of 3 quarter by 3 quarter inch square tubing rolled with a 62 inch radius to the outside of the curve. That way you're all good to go. You just chop it in pieces, weld it together, and it's good to go. But unfortunately, I've never seen a store that sells material like this off the shelf. So the next best way is to go to a metal fab shop with a machine that's designed for rolling curves into pieces. And that's exactly what I did to get this piece. I went to see my buddy Justin at a local high production metal fabrication shop. He used um, a three roller machine and rolled this thing out in a number of passes to get this perfect radius. And all I did was provide a template to lay it down to check the radius. Everything was great. And I shot video of the bending process at the time, but a recent computer crash, I think, deleted those video files. So unfortunately, I can't show you what that looks like here and now, but I do want to show you an alternate way of making a curved tube from a straight one. And it's kind of creative, and I think it fits well into the advanced cutting techniques section of the Grote Build Video series. So I'm going to switch the camera view and walk you through the process of turning straight pieces into curved ones. And as I make the transition from working with straight pieces to making curved ones, 
I want to ask that you consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. It's free, you know, and as a subscriber, you'll be first to be notified when new episodes of videos like this are uploaded to YouTube. So you can check them out when they're hot off the press. While you're at it and your fingers are busy clicking to subscribe, why don't you hit that thumbs up button with whatever heavy blunt instrument you happen to have at hand. And that lets the people at YouTube know there's something going on here at Next Level Carpentry. It boosts the numbers and helps build credibility for the channel. And it costs you only a second of your time and it's a nice perk for the channel. And while I'm paused here, I want to give a shout out to the guys at Acme Tools who sent this vise for this video, other tools for other videos, and they also stock a full range of Evolution metal cutting chop saws on their website at Acme Tool Crib of the North. So make sure to check that out and if you have the opportunity, tell them you heard about them at Next Level Carpentry and that I said they'll treat you like they treat me, which is top shelf, first class, and I always appreciate it. While we're on this shameless infomercial, check out links in the video description for t-shirts like this, posters like the ones around the shop, and links to other tools, materials, and supplies that you see in this and other videos here at Next Level Carpentry. And I don't want to let this segment pass without giving a huge shout out to the patrons for Next Level Carpentry on Patreon. There's a growing and active group of patrons there and merely for signing up as a patron, you have access to a whole list of exclusive patron only video content where there's a lot of in-depth stuff on this roller stand build video among other things and other projects from around the Next Level Carpentry Shop and from my day job where I do custom design build remodeling projects for a few discerning clients. So those projects end up being fairly demanding and fairly interesting. So if you're interested in that, motivated to become a patron for access to that video library or just to support the free video production I'm doing right now for YouTube here at the Next Level Carpentry channel, there's a link to that in the video description as well. And if you have that sort of inclination, you can always use the super thanks there on YouTube if you find something in this or other videos particularly useful and you want to throw a tip in the tip jar. So that is enough of all that. I'm going to clear off the work surface here and get into the process of turning a straight tube like this into a curved tube like this. As I've already mentioned a number of times, the radius of this tube is 62 inches to the top of that piece and you can see that spelled out in the PDF plans as well and there will be a link in the video description where you can purchase that set of PDF plans if you want all the information and details in one place rather than spread out throughout a five part build video series. And with that in mind, the first thing I want to do is create a template of a 62 inch radius so that I have something to work with for establishing the radius of these curved tubes. The length of those ramp tubes is under 24 inches, so I don't need much of a curve template to work with. So I'm just taking a chunk of scrap wood here. The edges of this piece are parallel and it's more than two feet long. So this will be adequate to make the pattern for this step. The simplest way I know to make a curved pattern on a short piece like this is to just take a piece of straight material that's longer than the radius. So in this case, longer than 62 inches. This has straight sides, parallel edges. I'm just going to mark the center. Happens to be three and a quarter inches. And then I'll just draw the center line down the entire length of the piece like so. And then I'm just going to put a mark at 70 inches to make sure that I've got plenty of room to work. And on this piece of scrap, I'm just going to mark it in the middle, which happens to be 13 inches for the center of a piece that's 26 inches long. Next, I'll square up those two marks, center the short one on the long one, and clamp it in place for the next step. Next, I'll measure one inch up from the edge of the template board. And from that one inch mark, I'll measure 62 inches back at an angle to the center line on the long board to locate the center point of this arc. Next, I'll measure 62 inches from the center mark I just established to the center mark on the pattern piece. And I'll use this length to set the beam compass for drawing the arc. With the setup at this stage, I'm ready to actually draw the arc. And to do that, I'm going to use a beam compass. And because beam compasses don't generally come this long, I'm just robbing parts off a little 12 inch model here that work on a half inch piece of fiberglass rod. And I just 
move the components onto this piece of half inch aluminum rod and set the pencil tip on that line and the compass point on the center mark and lock that little guy in place and presto I've got a 62 inch beam compass that I can draw this arc merely by pushing the point down into the melamine surface and drawing the arc on the piece of wood. And that, my friends, is quick, clean, and easy. While I'm at it and everything's set up, I'll draw a concentric arc three quarters of an inch away from the one I just drew so that I have a template for both the outside and inside radius of the tangent ramp tubes. With layout complete, I can pop the clamps off this setup and slide on over to my trusty bandsaw to cut the curves and complete the template. Naturally, if you don't have a trusty bandsaw sitting in the corner of your shop, this can be done almost as easily with a jigsaw or scroll saw, although you might spend a bit more time ferrying the curves when you're done with the cuts. And you can see here how the templates I just created match up to the curved ramp on the grout and to the piece of curved square tube my friend Justin rolled into shape at his shop. I freely admit that I've got a lot more experience bending wood than steel, but they're really not so different as you might think. So I'm going to walk you through the process to show you how a carpenter can curve steel. I started by taking this square steel tube and putting it up against the curve on the template. And an inch and a half of that follows the template pretty close without a gap, but going out to three or four inches starts to leave a little bit of a gap. So I thought that inch and a half was a good measurement and I took a piece of three quarter inch by three quarter inch wood and cut a kerf almost all the way through every inch and a half along that piece of wood. And you can see here how those kerfs allow that wood to bend and form a pretty smooth fit to the template. Especially when I use the inside radius template and a clamp to hold it in position. And you can see how smoothly the wood follows that curve so I'll just replicate the notch spacing in a piece of square steel tube about 24 inches long. To make the steel tube bendable, like the wood sample, I just transfer the kerf marks from the wood to the steel with a sharpie marker and a square after clamping the piece of oak to the piece of steel. But I'll have to cut the actual kerfs with the evolution saw rather than using the table saw like I did with the wood sample. Before cutting the bending kerfs in this piece of steel, I use the sharpie marker to draw a line for the approximate depth of the kerfs. And I also added a piece of half inch wood to the miter fence so that the kerfs are centered up on the tube when the blade comes down to make the cuts. Once all the kerfs are cut, I break out that 80 grit flap disc and buff the burrs off of both sides of all the kerfs to make the bending process cleaner and to prevent lacerating my pinkies in the process. And that takes care of a few more mouthfuls while eating this elephant. You don't have to be the sharpest chisel in the toolbox to figure out this next step, but I'll show you what bending this tube looks like anyways. I raise the template and tube off the work surface and then use some old clamps to pull the curved square tube against the template to hold the curve at the 62 inch radius I'm after. I make sure to use enough clamps to pull the pipe tight to the template so that the resulting piece ends up as a smooth, unfaceted curve. The next step is to get the curve to hold its shape and no surprise, I want to break out the Lincoln Power MIG 180C and use the magic of welding to get that done. I quickly convert my table saw into a welding table by covering it with an old scrap of OFD to protect the surface from sparks and then use medium heat and wire feed settings to lay a generous tack weld across the gap left by each of the sockets. As with any welder with limited experience like mine, it takes a while to dial in the wire speed feed and the voltage to tack weld across these relatively wide gaps. But after a bit of sputtering and sparking, I get it done. And wait a few minutes for the piece to cool down until I can handle it. Naturally, I get impatient and spritz the piece with a fine mist of cool water to accelerate the cooling process. And it takes just a minute of that to draw enough heat out of the piece that I can handle it. It's still kind of warm and you can see that shrinkage in the welds has caused the arc to tighten up a little bit. So I'll wait till it cools the rest of the way and work to flatten that curve ever so slightly. Once the piece is cool enough to handle comfortably, I use a little S-wing persuasion to coax it back to the final curve that I'm after. 
Here a tap, there a tap, everywhere a tap tap. And pretty soon the curve is smoothed out and back to the 62 inch radius I'm shooting for. Once I'm satisfied with the arc overall, I continue tack welding and adjusting until the arc is stiff, smooth, and the gaps are filled in. Well, after working on this curved piece for quite some time, I've arrived at that awkward moment in every maker's life, every carpenter, every metal fabricator, anybody that makes anything. And that's the moment when you realize you've headed off down a road that's a dead end. And in thinking through this a little bit, I realized that these curves are too wide and the metal's too thin for this process to work like expected. So I've got to backtrack a little bit and do this again and I'm going to approach it cutting those curves not with the evolution chop saw but with a 40,000 thick cutoff wheel because an eighth inch curve is just too wide for the job makes the rest of this too difficult and an experienced welder I'm sure could bridge those gaps and learn how to manage the heat but basically uh, that wide of a curve isn't necessary and I'm just going to leave this whole segment in the video because the steps that I went through to get to this stage with this tube are valid. So I'm going to make the embarrassing step of backpedaling and starting by laying out this tube and curfing it with that thinner wheel and see if that isn't a better way forward that I can actually recommend to viewers. So I'm going to grab a fork and a little glass of milk and chow down on that humble pie. After drawing marks for the curves as before, I just used my Madhabo grinder and that thin cutoff wheel to cut the bending curves in the tube. Make sure that all the curves are about the same depth. I start the cuts from one side, cut them down to the line, and then flip the tube over to finish up the cuts to the line on the opposite side of the tube. It takes a little longer to cut all those cuts freehand, but the clamping and bending process works equally well as the wider curves, and hopefully the extra time I spent cutting, I'll save on welding. Now I'm at the point of second verse, same as the first, where I apply tack weld across the gaps of these narrower curves to stabilize the piece at this 62 inch radius. And tacking across the gaps of those narrower curves goes a whole lot better and smoother than the wider ones I attempted earlier. A lot less time, a lot less weld, a lot less heat, and a lot less shrinkage mean a lot less trouble in forming this curved rail this time. It still takes a few light tasks with a hammer to reverse the shrinkage caused by cooling welds, but it's a whole lot faster and a whole lot more manageable this time than it was the last time. And I am quite pleased with that. Thankfully, this rewind doesn't take much time at all, and soon I'm back to adding tack welds on the corners to further stabilize the piece before I go back and use stitch welding to close up the rest of the curves so that the tube will have a solid look when it's complete. When I'm done with the second round of spot welds, I recheck the curvature and use a bit of gentle persuasion to flatten the curve a little bit so that the piece fits the template before going back to the jig and using a stitch welding technique to close up the bending curves the rest of the way. The last step is to use welds to finish closing up the gaps left by the curves on the inside radius of the tube. Now that I'm done welding and this piece has cooled off, you can see that I've got a bit of a Franken tube on my hands here with the welds filling in all the bending curves on this piece. But the important thing is that the curve is smooth, the radius is true, and the piece is plenty rigid for supporting the ramp on the outfeed roller. So this is the perfect opportunity to brush up my grinding skills. And to do that, I'm using a Metabo 5-inch grinder with a metal cutting disc in there. And I'll use it to clean this piece up so that it's got a nice fit and finish for the finished stand. I use a couple vice grips to clamp the tube down to my sacrificial work surface and get after my glumpy welds one at a time to remove the bulk of the excess weld and then finish up with sweeping passes as this face of the tube gets smoothed up and looking good. And this process clearly demonstrates why I'm a much more accomplished grinder than welder. But with an acceptably few minutes of grinding, I've got one side of the tube all cleaned up so I can proceed to the other side and finish up with the welds on the inside radius of this tube. After I finish grinding the last few welds on the inside radius of the tube, I take a quick pass along the corners to remove little tidbits of weld there and then switch to the 80 grit flap disc to clean up grinder marks and make the piece fit for finishing. Well, here's what the finished kerf bent tube looks like after that grind o -rama. It's a nice finished piece. There's a couple little indications on the underside where you can see the edges of the welds, but it fits true to the pattern with a nice smooth curve, no twist, 
no funny things going on there. And you can also see that it matches up quite nicely to the piece that was roller bent at the steel fab shop. So that is how to get an acceptable piece if you're not able to have the tubes rolled. So the last thing to do with this is to miter one end and cut it to length so it's the right size for the roller stand. Keep in mind that I chose to miter the corners on the roller ramp frame. So I'll cut a 45 degree angle on the end of one tube and there needs to be a left and a right tube. If you want to save the trouble of cutting those mitered angles, you can just run the side tube straight and fit the other one in between or vice versa. So you just have to deal with fitting square cuts instead of these miters. I use a sharpie and a square to mark the direction of the 45 degree angle on the end of this tube so that I don't get mixed up and cut two pieces for the same side of the ramp. And to make this cut, I pivot the fence to 45 degrees and use that sharpie mark to orient the piece to make sure that I'm cutting the right angle on the right end of the right piece. Curvature of the ramp tubes makes it a little bit tricky to cut the miter on the tube for the opposite side of the ramp, but with a little creative positioning, firm clamping, and careful cutting, it's totally doable. Even though a slight shift in the position of the tube as I was making the first cut means that I need to reposition, tighten the clamp, and take a trimming cut for an acceptable miter on this particular piece. Once the miters are cut, I use a flat tape to measure and mark 22 and 3 quarter inch overall length of the ramp support tubes so I can reposition the saw's fence and cut both tubes to exact length in one pass. After fabricating the kerf bent roller ramp tube and cutting the miters on the two pairs that I'll use for my roller stands, I feel that I've had just about as many elephant steaks as I can handle for right now. So for dessert, I want to show you what this roller ramp support frame looks like now that all the pieces are complete. Starting with the notched tube from early in this episode, I can lay it on the left and right mitered roller ramp support tubes, place this spacer that was cut in episode one in between, and use a squeeze clamp to hold the whole works together, approximately like that, so that you can see how this mitered piece will fit in the end here and get all welded up for a nice, clean, solid, and rigid frame that supports the acrylic piece that makes up the ramp itself. Well, that pretty well covers the advanced cutting techniques that I wanted to show you in this episode, and I hope it leaves you with the sense that this build is kind of challenging, but it's entirely doable when approached methodically in steps. Looking ahead to episode three, I'll cover advanced fabrication, which goes beyond the cuts that you've seen so far in the series and includes shaping rounded corners, drilling for bolts and hardware, sleeve fitting of the height adjustment tubes with the seams impossible tool, the leg leveler nut assembly, adjustment lever nuts, modifying the adjustment lever bolts, and grinding for weld prep along with any other related stuff that comes to mind during the build process so that everything is ready to be welded up in episode four. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that it would be worth it to buy the specialized tools you see here in use in this build series for a single project like this, but if you're inclined to expand your maker skill set for this and other metalworking projects, I can tell you that every dime I've spent over the years on some specialty tools has given me an excellent ROI. And I do believe that basic metalworking skills, like you see me using here in this video series, are a great asset for any next level carpenter and are worth developing to increase the range and type of potential projects that they're able to take on. This will definitely prove that I'm not a next level salesman, but I do want you to know that most of the tools you see me using here in this build video series have been acquired over the years from a wide range of sources. So I think that there's definitely no shame in finding tools like these at garage sales or auctions. However, if you do find yourself in the market for new tools, please consider shopping with Next Level Carpentry at Acme Tools. With great pricing, in-depth product knowledge, and excellent customer service, Acme is a great source, especially when compared to other online sellers. Plus, they pay ad fees from link sales to the channel that helps support video production here and is always appreciated. It would be great to hear from viewers who are following this series to build a pair of groats for their shop or for their job site. So feel free to post comments below the video to share your stories. And I'll catch up with all of you in episode three. So as always, and until next time, thanks for watching. Well, hey.
thanks for sticking around to the end of the end of the end. I guess I'm getting a little bit predictable here in including extra content at the end of the video. And as a reward for your perseverance, I want to show you a few things that I have courtesy of two Justins. The first Justin is Justin P of Projects in Rapid City. And with his coding expertise, he was able to restore the two video clips that I have that I have courtesy of the other Justin, which is Justin H, where he took time out of his busy schedule at a high production metal fabrication shop to use his custom uh, tubing roller machine to roll the 10 foot section of three quarter by three quarter square tubing that I used on this prototype stand and on the other tubes that I'm using in this five part build video series. So thanks Justin P for recreating, restoring these files. It's a huge relief to me to have that and a bunch of other files restored. And thanks to Justin H for rolling those tubes because having rolled tubes is a whole lot less work than the Franken tubes I created in this video. So without delay, I'll jump into those video clips to show you the amazing process of rolling square tubes into smooth arcs. So this is the inside of Justin's shop and right there front and center is the rolling machine. There's three rollers as you can see and by adjusting the spacing between the rollers that determines how tight the radius gets. We started out with a straight piece and have already run it over the machine a number of times and are kind of dialing into the radius. So after another pass, we take it to the template I made. That's a 62 inch radius drawn on that little thin piece of plywood there. And you can see it's come a long way from straight, but has a little ways to go to get to that tighter radius. So Justin adjusts the settings on the machine, the spacing of the rollers, etc. Get the piece started. And once the piece is started, flip the switch. Once everything's lined up, flip the switch and run it through. And then this tightens up the radius each time. We're trying to hold the piece level as it goes across the machine. And I think overall we probably did eight or 10 passes. And we're kind of dialing it in here, to get the radius to match up. I don't know what we would have done if it got too tight, but uh, Justin's experience with the machine allows him to kind of sneak up on it and add just a little bit more bend in the piece. One thing that I do want to say about rolling the pieces this way, there's about eight inches, six to eight inches at the end of each piece of this curved tube that's still straight. And that's got to do with the spacing between the second and third rollers. So the idea is to bend a long piece and cut it into sections instead of bending short pieces because I'd have to probably bend pieces that are three feet long to get a two foot rolled section because it's gonna, it's gonna leave six inches of straight tube on either side. But after each setting, we just kind of go through the gears, lather, rinse, repeat until the tubing is at the right radius. But the beauty of this is how smooth the curve comes out and how consistent over the length of that piece. I don't, I don't remember what that was, at least 12 feet long. And I, I got it long enough so that I could cut various sections out of it. And as it turned out with this project, I cut it right down. There's about an inch or two inches of waste at the end of this piece after I ultimately cut six separate roller ramp support pieces out of it. So it worked out great. And I'm not sure how many production shops have a machine like this, but it's a much quicker, cleaner and simpler way of getting curved tubes compared to curve bending like I did. And there might be other methods out there, but at least here at the end of the end, you get to see what this option looks like. And you can probably hire somebody at a local fab shop with that same machine to roll out pieces if you're making a pair of stands. But you can see here that the final bend is about as close as you could expect to perfect for these tubes for the version 2.0 Groat outfeed roller stand. So there it is then, the end of the end of the end of the end of this video. And until next time in episode three, thanks for watching.